dear colleagues, dear organizers, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to give a clinical update on the treatment of anorexia nervosa at the Congress of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists. This is a great honor for me. My name is Hubertus Himmerich. I am a clinical senior lecturer in eating disorders at King's College London, and I do my clinical work as a consultant psychiatrist at the Batham Royal Hospital on an inpatient ward for people with eating disorders. 90% of our patients on this ward suffer from anorexia nervosa. Even though uh, this seminar focuses on anorexia nervosa, I won't ignore other eating disorders completely because uh, within the eating disorders, clinical features can change over time and a proportion of patients with anorexia nervosa transition to bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. I will therefore start this seminar with an introduction that summarizes novel developments in the whole field of eating disorders. This summary will cover recent findings regarding the epidemiology of eating disorders, the diagnostic changes introduced by DSM-5, psychiatric and somatic comorbidities of eating disorders, their risk factors and potential preventive strategies, and novel developments in clinical anorexia nervosa research. After this introduction, I would like to cover some pathophysiological aspects of eating disorders by presenting a pathophysiological model of eating disorders based on genetic findings, which includes factors outside the body, biological factors within the body, and the eating disorders phenotype. Regarding drug treatment, I will summarize the evidence from randomized controlled trials for the psychopharmacological treatment of anorexia nervosa, talk about medication to treat mental and physical comorbidities and health consequences, and present a survey on the patients and carers view on medication to treat anorexia nervosa. As psychotherapy is still the main pillar of our treatment, alongside dietary advice and physical health monitoring, I'll mention established psychotherapeutic treatments in anorexia nervosa and introduce a novel approach for anorexia nervosa patients with a low BMI who would not be able to engage in the traditional psychotherapies. During my clinical practice in the field, I have witnessed the benefits of music therapy in the treatment of anorexia nervosa. Therefore, I would like to present a mixed methods study and a systematic review on the use of music in eating disorders. At the end of the talk, I'll provide some perspectives for the treatment of anorexia nervosa in the future. I won't cover family therapy, legal aspects, treatment under restraint or tube feeding, even though these are important aspects of our daily work with anorexia nervosa patients. Uh, my core themes are the biology of anorexia nervosa, medication and the use of music in people with anorexia nervosa, and therefore I will prioritize these aspects during my talk. Eating disorders are highly prevalent worldwide, especially in women. Their point prevalence has increased from about 4 to about 8% over the last two decades, challenging public health and healthcare providers. The results of therapeutic interventions for different eating disorders are not satisfactory. In anorexia nervosa, for example, outpatient psychotherapy has variable impact on weight gain, improvements from inpatient care often fail to be sustained, and most pharmacological interventions are of limited benefit. In fact, there is no approved medication available for the treatment of anorexia nervosa at the moment. Thus, the eating disorders field 
need substantial amendments to current therapies or completely new treatment approaches. The diagnostic spectrum of eating disorders has widened with bulimia nervosa added in the 1980s and binge eating disorder finally accepted into the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 2013 alongside what were considered childhood feeding disorders, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, pica and rumination disorder. These diagnostic changes make the interpretation of epidemiological data and comparisons with previous studies difficult. Furthermore, case finding is difficult as approximately 80% of patients do not seek treatment and cases of anorexia nervosa are rarely identified through screening measures. The three most prevalent DSM-5 eating disorder diagnoses in adults are anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. The prevalence of anorexia nervosa is about 1% among women, and the main criteria for the diagnosis are a clinically significant low body weight in the context of age, sex, and physical health, an intense fear of weight gain, and a disturbed body perception. Criteria for the diagnosis of bulimia nervosa are recurrent binges, recurrent vomiting, excessive physical activity or fasting, and excessive occupation with food figure and weight. The prevalence for bulimia nervosa is between 1 and 2 percent. Criteria for the diagnosis of binge eating disorder are recurrent binge eating, with control loss, plus three of the following, rapid consumption of food, eating until an unpleasant feeling of fullness is reached, eating without being hungry, frequent food intake with the consequences of embarrassment, disgust, or feeling of guilt after a binge, and uh, suffering pressure due to one's eating habits. But no compensatory measures for weight reduction. Binge eating disorder is the most prevalent of all the eating disorders worldwide. Eating disorders are associated with specific psychiatric and somatic comorbidities, which may proceed, occur with, or be a consequence of the disorder. For example, anorexia nervosa is associated with anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, and autistic spectrum disorder whereas people with binge eating or purging eating disorders are at risk for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, alcohol, and other substance use disorders. In the NESARC-3 survey, which investigated somatic comorbidities, anorexia nervosa was associated with fibromyalgia, anemia, and osteoporosis. Further known consequences of the dietary deficit in anorexia nervosa may include growth retardation, osteopenia, renal insufficiency, changes in laboratory parameters, and ventricular arrhythmias. Binge eating disorder was associated with diabetes, hypertension, elevated cholesterol, and triglycerides in the NASAC 3 survey. The comorbidities may partly be explained by recent genetic breakthroughs, which are reshaping our perception of anorexia nervosa as a metabopsychiatric disorder. Genome-wide association studies on anorexia nervosa show genetic overlaps between anorexia nervosa and psychiatric disorders, in particular obsessive compulsive disorder, major depression and schizophrenia, as well as high physical activity and the overlap with, with genes for low BMI. Independently of the diagnostic eating disorders categories, loss of control of eating in the context of early traumatic or stressful events, weight stigma, dieting and mood disorders 
have become prevalent and poses new problems. It has especially increased in sexual, gender and ethnic minorities. Data from three ongoing birth cohorts in the UK indicate that weight control behaviors have increased in adolescents of both genders. Almost 50% report dieting, with weight concerns being associated with depression. High-risk subgroups are athletes, dancers, military personnel, and people with type 1 diabetes, where weight and eating patterns are relevant for aesthetic functional or health performance. Sociocultural risk factors, such as changes in food and eating culture, have created an obesogenic environment. Public health interventions to prevent obesity may have fueled weight stigma and thus might have become a risk factor for eating disorders. Longitudinally, food addiction and psychological distress mediate the link between weight stigma and binge eating disorder in adolescents. Social media use, particularly of photo based activities, online self presentations, and the use of websites advocating eating disorder behaviors as a lifestyle choice increase the risk for eating disorders in vulnerable individuals. Risk factors such as body dissatisfaction, dieting, and weight control behaviors increase the risk for both obesity and eating disorders. Educating young people, their parents, teachers and tutors to be mindful of these risks and equipping them with resilience skills are successful preventive strategies. Not only have the challenges increased, improvements in our understanding of anorexia nervosa have also been made, specifically if we have a look at genetics, brain imaging and immunology. Even though no medication has been approved for the treatment of anorexia nervosa yet, recent RCTs on the antipsychotic olanzapine and the cannabinoid receptor agonist stronabinol have yielded promising results. We have also seen the development of novel psychological therapies such as cognitive remediation training and cognitive remediation and emotional skills training. And improvements have been made in the management of comorbidities. Even though this is rarely a topic in medical or psychiatric journals, creative art therapies such as music therapy or occupational therapy are part of the treatment programs we provide for our people with anorexia nervosa. Therefore, I would like to talk about these areas with you. Two years ago, we reviewed important findings derived from formal and molecular genetics in order to outline a genetics-based, but also clinically relevant pathophysiological model of eating disorders. In order to create this pathophysiological model based on the results of genetic studies, we rearranged the findings to include the factors outside the human body, which relate to the social environment, uh, the physical environment and nutritional factors. The biology of the body, which is significantly influenced by genes and comprises the microbiota living in our gut and three important regulatory systems of the body, the metabolic and endocrine system, the immune system and the brain and the resulting eating disorder phenotype, which includes the direct symptoms of an eating disorder, but also the physical and mental consequences of it. I will lead you through the model step by step and explain what the clinical significance of these components are. Relevant factors in the development of an eating disorder from outside the body include the social environment, the physical environment and nutritional factors. Within the social environment, the socioeconomic status, culture and lifestyle, a certain ideal of beauty, relationships and psychosocial stresses 
including academic challenges, can have an impact on the emergence of an eating disorder. Additional relevant factors outside the human body mutually influencing each other include the physical environment, diet and the use of medication and probiotics. These factors can play a role as predisposing and precipitating factors in our psychotherapeutic formulation. For example, when a teenage girl does not fit the beauty ideal of her peers, is bullied for having fat thighs and starts a diet, she might develop symptoms of anorexia nervosa. It is to has been shown that bullying can lead to dieting, and dieting is a major risk factor for the development of an eating disorder. The most important elements of the biology of the human body for the development of an eating disorder, from a genetic perspective, include the microbiome, the metabolic system, the immune system, and the brain. It has been hypothesized that microbes in the gastrointestinal tract manipulate the host's eating behavior to increase microbe fitness. Microbes may do this through generating cravings for foods that they specialize on or foods that suppress their competitors or inducing dysphoria until individuals eat foods for the benefit of the microbes in their body. Such nutritional and environmental factors can lead to an imbalance of the microbiome, which as a consequence alters the production of short-chain fatty acids, including acetic, propionic and butyric acid, and of certain enzymes, including caseinolytic peptidase B, which is a mimetic of alpha MSH, which is a hypothalamic hormone that decreases appetite. These gut bacteria and the molecules they produce influence the metabolic system, the, inf the immune system, and the brain. The metabolic and endocrine system comprises a number of metabolic and endocrine organs, including the gastrointestinal tract, the liver, endocrine glands, like the pancreas and the thyroid, and the fatty tissue, in addition to certain cell functions, including the transport of glucose into the cell. This system is influenced by food intake, diet, medication, physical activity, the homeostatic system of the brain and the immune system. It can alter the metabolism of cholesterol and lipids and can send various hormonal signals, including ghrelin, insulin and leptin, to the brain and the immune system. From a pathophysiological perspective, the importance of the metabolic system in eating disorders is clear because we find a reduced fat mass, hypothyroidism and hypoglycemia in people with anorexia nervosa. These are mainly consequences of the disorder. From a genetic perspective, however, we meanwhile know that the metabolic system plays also a causal role in the development of anorexia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is, for example, associated with a variant of the anchoring repeat domain 50 gene, which is highly expressed in endocrine tissues and the pancreas. And anorexia nervosa is genetically related to genes which influence fat mass and the BMI. This underlines what I said earlier. Anorexia nervosa should be seen as a metabopsychiatric disorder, and the metabolic features should not all be seen as a consequence of the psychological problems. It is important to keep the metabolic system in mind as a source of predisposing factors to develop an eating disorder. For example, Diabetes type 1 is a condition that can elicit disordered eating or even result in anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa, 
which is referred to as diabolemia. At King's Health Partners, we run a clinical project on type 1 diabetes and disordered eating. This project is a multidisciplinary network of mental health and diabetes experts under the guidance of Professor Khalida Ismail, who is a psychiatrist at King's College Hospital. It provides patient-focused treatment for people living with type 1 diabetes and disordered eating. These patients often restrict their insulin intake to lose weight, which can lead to serious complications such as blindness or amputations. For people who have a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa plus type 1 diabetes, our ward provides inpatient support to help with taking insulin, with having the right amount of carbs and with negative feelings around weight gain. Another important system from a genetic perspective is the immune system. The immune system reacts to stress, food intake and components of bacteria. And the immune system is of course activated by inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. A nationwide population-based cohort study from Cynthia Bulik's research group published by Hetman and colleagues which included a cohort of more than 2.5 million individuals born in Sweden, found that autoimmune diseases increase the hazard to be subsequently diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. And an anorexia nervosa diagnosis increased the risk of being diagnosed with an autoimmune diagnosis. This relationship might have therapeutic implications in the future. The autoimmune disease will lead to increased production of cytokines. These cytokines influence the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and neurotransmitter metabolism in the brain. They influence mood, appetite and weight regulation. And this might contribute to the development of anorexia nervosa. Because even in patients with anorexia nervosa without any autoimmune disease, we have recently found increased levels of interleukin-6. There are meanwhile cytokine blockers available like Eternacept or Tocilizumab, which are approved for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis and other autoimmune diseases. This drug might constitute a future treatment option for anorexia nervosa, specifically for people with both an autoimmune disease and anorexia nervosa. I'll talk more about the significance of the immune system in the pathophysiology of psychiatric disorders in my keynote lecture on Wednesday at 8.30 in the morning. Genetic studies have also found associations in genes related to my neurotransmitter systems which are used in the so-called self-regulatory, the hedonic and the homeostatic system. These systems relate to the reasons why we eat or not eat. For example, we may stick to a specific diet because of a certain ideal of beauty, or maybe because we are sad, or we know that eating can comfort us. These things happen in the self-regulatory system. The self-regulatory system embeds eating into the social context, creates individual values and performs self-regulatory control. Its main center lies in the prefrontal cortex. This brain system receives input from social and cultural factors and from the environment. Another reason for us to eat is to have fun. The function of the hedonic system is to elicit the desire to eat and to evoke pleasure during food consumption. Its neurons and synapses can be found mainly in the prefrontal cortex, the basal ganglia and the thalamus. This system receives information from the sensory organs and the hippocampus. Being hungry also creates an urge to eat to ensure that we consume sufficient energy to keep our body functioning. This hunger originates from the homeostatic system, 
that integrates peripheral signals of food consumption and energy storages and regulates appetite. The hypothalamus plays a prominent role in this system. The hypothalamus receives input from peripheral signals of food consumption and energy storages and from the self-regulation system and the hedonic system. In this figure, you can see how the neurocircuits are all related and which signaling molecules, including neurotransmitters and hormones, they use. Important neurotransmitters of the self-regulation system are serotonin, noradrenaline, acetylcholine, the excitatory transmitter glutamate and the inhibitory messenger gamma-aminobutyric gamma acid. The main neurotransmitters of the hedonic system are dopamine, opioids and cannabinoids. And signaling molecules of the homeostatic system include um, peripheral appetite regulating hormones like leptin, ghrelin, insulin and glucagon-like peptide 1. Hypothalamic appetite regulators like NPY, agouti-related peptide, alpha-MSH and CART, and the neurotransmitter histamine. I am aware that this might be a lot of new information. If you are interested in the neurocircuits, the underlying brain imaging results, and how this all relates to the development of eating disorders, I, I recommend our article Psychopharmacological Advances in Eating Disorders, published in the journal Expert Review of Clinical Psychopharmacology in 2018. The combination of the biological processes, which are influenced by environmental and nutritional factors, lead to the behavioral traits in eating disorders, an altered motivation towards food intake, and altered physical activity. In eating disorders, however, the phenotype is not only defined by the psychological and behavioral symptoms of the disorder, but also by its consequences. For example, in the case of anorexia nervosa, malnutrition and an impairment of organ structure and function. And this phenotype, which constitutes the clinical signs and symptoms, will in turn influence factors outside the body and the biology of the body. For example, malnutrition and an impairment of organ structure and function will have biological implications and the anorexic thoughts and behaviors will put a strain on the patient's relationship and probably lead to social withdrawal. Before starting to think about the pharmacological treatment of eating disorders and especially anorexia nervosa, it is worthwhile considering the comorbidities of eating disorders. Common comorbidities of eating disorders are affective disorders, anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD and substance use disorders. If we go one step further and think about the involved neurotransmitter system, we come across the neurotransmitters serotonin, noradrenaline and dopamine with regard to affective disorders, anxiety, OCD and ADHD. And we bang into the cannabinoid and opioid system as well as the dopamine system with regard to addictive disorders. Therefore, a transdiagnostic psychopharmacological approach would make us consider that medication targeting these comorbidities may possibly be effective to help with eating disorders as well. Now let us proceed to the clinical trials that have been performed in anorexia nervosa. As olanzapine leads to weight gain in patients with schizophrenia as a side effect of the antipsychotic treatment, it was suggested to be suitable for the treatment of patients with anorexia nervosa where weight gain would be one of the therapeutic goals. Therefore, Evelyn Atia and colleagues performed a study investigating the effect of olanzapine versus placebo in outpatients with anorexia nervosa. The study has been published two years ago in the American Journal of Psychiatry. They performed a randomized placebo-controlled trial. 
patients received olanzapine or placebo for 16 weeks. The primary outcome was weight gain. They included adults with anorexia nervosa and uh, the BMI and the medical status had to be appropriate for an outpatient study, which meant a BMI between 14 and 18.5. Prior to inclusion, patients had to show no weight gain in four weeks of treatment as usual. They approached 1,311 patients. 201 gave informed consent, but only 152 could be randomized and only 83 completed 16 weeks of treatment with olanzapine or placebo. 41 in the olanzapine group and 42 in the placebo group. Patients in both groups started at a BMI around 17, which is a body weight of about 53 kilograms. If a patient received olanzapine, the mean weight gain per month was around 0.72 kilogram. If randomized to placebo, the mean weight gain per month was about 0.26 kilogram. This difference was statistically significant. However, you can see in this figure that not all the patients in the olanzapine group gained weight, and the statistical effect may be due to the subgroup of people who benefited from the medication. However, there was no beneficial statistical effect on the psychopathology of anorexia nervosa. Thus, olanzapine may be mainly helping with weight gain, but it is unclear whether it helps with the core psychopathology of anorexia nervosa, which is the fear of gaining weight and the body image disturbance. This is a summary of clinical drug trials in anorexia nervosa. One psychopharmacological group of drugs that has been tested is antipsychotics. Olanzapine, which is an antihistaminergic, antidopaminergic, and antiserotonergic agent, has meanwhile been tested in five randomized and placebo controlled trials. One of them is the RCT conducted by Monica Atia and colleagues. The others were somewhat smaller RCTs in adults, but also in adolescents. Overall, olanzapine showed superiority to placebo in terms of weight gain. Ketiapine has been tested in two RCTs with contradictory results, and there's one negative study for risperidone in anorexia nervosa. There are few case reports and a case series for aripiprazole, which yielded positive results. With regard to antidepressants, there is one case controlled study for mirtazapine, an antihistaminergic antidepressant. It was tested in adolescent patients with anorexia nervosa. This trial showed a marginal superiority compared to non pharmacological treatment. There are also a few positive case reports for mirtazapine in patients with anorexia nervosa and depression available in the literature. Furthermore, there are studies published using uh, decycloserin and tronabinol. Decycloserin is an NMDA receptor agonist. In a small RCT, a greater increase in BMI was reported in the decycloserin group compared to the placebo group. Tronabinol is a cannabinoid receptor agonist. In one trial, Tronabinol showed a significantly greater increase in weight gain compared to placebo. Thus, at the moment, we have some evidence for olanzapine and tronabinol to be effective against anorexia nervosa. Tronabinol influences the cannabinoid system, and olanzapine impacts on the dopaminergic, the histaminergic, and the serotonergic transmission. On our ward for inpatients with anorexia nervosa at the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, we did a chart review of 12 inpatients with anorexia nervosa as an audit. Patients who didn't gain weight during inpatient therapy, including a variety of psychological therapies, family therapy, dietary advice, OT and nursing, received olanzapine for eight weeks in addition to their usual clinical care. 
Olanzapine was prescribed according to clinical needs. During these eight weeks of olanzapine treatment, they gained a mean of 4.6 kg, which equals an increase in BMI of 1.8. This figure shows the significant increase in BMI of the 12 inpatients with anorexia nervosa over the course of eight weeks. Thus, we have some own evidence uh, from, from our own data that olanzapine may be a therapeutic option for patients not responding to psychotherapy. Sloan Medden from the University of Sydney and I have successfully applied to the NIHR and the NIHMRC to do a feasibility study on olanzapine in young people with anorexia nervosa. And this study will start soon. I have to say I uh, had to submit this grant application eight times over four years before we finally got this grant. This feasibility will test open treatment of 70 patients, 55 in the UK and 15 in Australia, with olanzapine for 12 months. The participants will be examined at baseline at 8 weeks, 16 weeks, 6 months and 12 months after the start of the treatments. We will include males and females between 12 and 24 years of age with an inadequate response to first-line treatment. We hope that we'll be allowed to proceed to a full RCT if this feasibility study is successful to test whether olanzapine is effective in adolescents and adults, male and female patients, and in patients' daycare and outpatients. One problem in targeting anorexia nervosa with a psychopharmacological approach is the resistance of people with anorexia nervosa to consent to a medication that leads to weight gain. Even though patients often don't have a problem with taking a plethora of medications targeting the physical health consequences of their eating disorder. Uh, therefore, we wanted to find out what do patients and carers think about medication targeting anorexia nervosa symptoms? What symptoms this medication target? What concerns do patients and carers have? And what are the feared side effects of medication? Thus, we performed a survey in 17 patients and 16 carers, and they completed questionnaires with corresponding questions. More than half of the patients disagreed or strongly disagreed with the view that medication would be able to reduce anorexia nervosa symptoms, whereas only 6% of carers disagreed with this statement. About 80% of patients with anorexia nervosa had the concern that their appetite might increase during drug treatment. And about the same number of patients with anorexia nervosa had the concern drug treatment might lead to weight gain. Thus, patients fear that medication could lead to weight gain. Nonetheless, they do not think that medication could help with anorexia nervosa. More than half of the patients and the majority of carers said they would find medication useful if it helped reduce anxiety. Comparably, most of the patients and most of the carers said that medication should help with sleep problems. In addition, 75% of patients and 93% of carers were positive about more scientific research on psychopharmacological treatment in anorexia nervosa. These results indicate that patients with anorexia nervosa despite believing medication does not help to treat symptoms of anorexia nervosa, and their carers would, in principle, welcome research on psychopharmacological treatment. Furthermore, our results reveal that the majority of patients with anorexia nervosa would consider medication to treat their anxiety or sleep problems. 
the primary outcome criterion in the majority of randomized controlled trials in anorexia nervosa is an increase in body mass index. As the risks of low body weight in anorexia are clear from a medical point of view. However, from a patient's perspective, they might feel such a trial and such psychopharmacological treatment were just a way to speed up weight gain for the clinician's benefit rather than for helping their anxieties and their problems. On a meta level, I think we should ask ourselves if we prescribe medication, do I prescribe this drug to help the patient with their anxieties and fears? Or do I prescribe this medication to treat my own anxiety or boost my own ambition to get a patient with anorexia nervosa to a higher body weight? Equally, I have to ask myself, who does not want weight gain? Is it the patient or is it the anorexia? And as clinicians, we should never collude with the disorder. We have already talked about the fact that patients with eating disorders often have comorbid psychiatric disorders, such as affective disorders and anxiety disorders. Eating disorders are associated with high mortality, partly caused by suicide, and many patients with eating disorders suffer from sleep disturbances. Eating disorders may lead to malnutrition. For example, binge eating disorder can lead to overnutrition and obesity, whereas anorexia nervosa and avoidant restrictive food intake disorder will result in undernutrition with a lack of nutrients, dehydration, or specific deficiencies in certain vitamins, minerals, or iron. Chronic malnutrition will lead to physical health consequences, and as a result, the eating disorder, the comorbid mental health problems, the malnutrition, and the physical health consequences may all need specific psychopharmacological or pharmacological approaches. Social anxiety and depression have been found to be the most common psychiatric comorbidities in patients with eating disorders. In anorexia nervosa, for example, Recent studies found comorbidity rates of more than 50% for social anxiety disorder, 40% for depression, and 25% for generalized anxiety disorder. In depression, without eating disorders, uh, just in depression, it is recommended to use second generation antidepressants as first line treatment, such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, selective serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, noradrenaline and dopamine reuptake inhibitors, or noradrenergic and specific serotonergic antidepressants. In anorexia nervosa, the clinical challenge lies in the differentiation of depressive symptoms that are a consequence of self-starvation, transitory, and likely to improve without antidepressant medication during the recovery from anorexia nervosa, from those that signal the presence of an additional depressive episode in its own right. Criteria that are indicative of a depression process independent from self-starvation are a familial history of a mood disorder, the time course of the trajectory of symptoms, and specific features such as morning insomnia, daily variation, suicidal ideations or attempts, and ruminations related to guilt and unworthiness. SSRIs have not been found to have much benefit targeting depressive symptoms in the acute phase of anorexia nervosa. A potential explanation may be that people with anorexia nervosa have a deficit in amino acids such as tryptophan, which is needed for the production of the neurotransmitter serotonin. The SSRI fluoxetine is approved for the treatment of bulimia nervosa symptoms 
and is often prescribed for people who suffer from binge purge type anorexia nervosa uh, and depression. But little is known about how effective fluoxetine is as an antidepressant in people with anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. Interestingly, a study performed by Leon Bruni and colleagues compared two SSRIs, fluoxetine and citalopram in bulimia nervosa, and this study showed different efficacy profiles. Citalopram seemed to be a better or seemed to better address depressive symptoms in patients with bulimia nervosa, whereas fluoxetine was more beneficial to bulimic symptoms and other clinical features associated with bulimia nervosa. With regard to mirtazapine, I would say that it may help with depressive and anxious symptoms in weight-restored anorexia nervosa patients. However, one of its side effects is weight gain. Therefore, I will not prescribe it in people with binge eating disorder or obesity as first choice. Bupropion has been shown to lead to a reduction of anxious and depressive symptoms and binge frequency in a binge eating disorder. However, it is contraindicated in anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa because important side effects of bupropion are weight loss and epileptic seizures. And epileptic seizures can also be a consequence of self-starvation. For eating disorder patients with manic episodes, we recommend olanzapine and anorexia nervosa and risperidone in bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. Whereas for bipolar depression, olanzapine plus potentially fluoxetine seems appropriate in anorexia nervosa. The motrigin um, is recommended in bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. Acute anxiety or suicidality may warrant benzodiazepine treatment with lorazepam and non-benzodiazepines or promethazine uh, may be considered for sleeping problems. If a patient shows specific deficiencies of certain vitamins, trace elements or electrolytes, these nutrients should be supplemented. However, there are a few things we need to know about those deficiencies and the associated changes in laboratory parameters. Hypokalemia is often the result of vomiting. Thus, it is not enough to prescribe oral potassium supplementation. The patient will also need support to stop or reduce vomiting. Hypokalemia may also be a result of a lack of magnesium. Therefore, magnesium is indicated in persistent hypokalemia. If a patient shows low phosphate levels, this might indicate refeeding syndrome. Therefore, if a patient with anorexia nervosa shows low phosphate levels, check for the concentrations of other electrolytes or clinical signs of refeeding syndrome. Hematological changes indicating iron deficiency usually disappear with weight restoration. Therefore, a mixed balanced diet is the best medication for this kind of deficiencies. If a patient with anorexia nervosa suffers from osteoporosis, please keep in mind that calcium and vitamin D by themselves do not restore bone density. All organ systems can suffer as a consequence of a severe and enduring eating disorder. Important physical health consequences of anorexia nervosa affect the gastrointestinal tract, the bones and the skin, and can lead to a lot of pain. Regarding the GI tract, anorexia nervosa patients may suffer from gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is usually treated with proton pump inhibitors, gastroparesis, where the antiemetic and prokinetic agent domperidone might help, Abdominal discomfort, which can be alleviated with the antispasmodic mebeverine, or constipation, for which we usually prescribe lactulose or prune juice. Osteoporosis in anorexia nervosa might require treatment with biphosphonates. For pain, we usually use paracetamol, and skin problems are often 
a symptom of vitamin deficiency or require treatment with specific ointments. Regarding the psychotherapy of anorexia nervosa, I would like to recommend our open access book chapter on evidence-based and novel psychological therapies for people with anorexia nervosa. This chapter explains predisposing, precipitating and perpetuating factors in anorexia nervosa and a variety of psychotherapeutic treatments for adults and adolescents. It is an open access chapter which is part of the book Weight Management and it is available for free from the publisher's homepage at www.intechopen.com. In this book chapter, we have covered the evidence for established psychotherapeutic methods. There is currently evidence from open clinical studies and RCTs for CBTE, which is Cognitive Behavior Therapy in Eating Disorders, the Maudsley Anorexia Nervosa Treatment for Adults, Specialist Supportive Clinical Management, Eating Disorder Focused Focal Psychodynamic Therapy, Adolescent Focused Psychotherapy for Anorexia Nervosa, and Anorexia Nervosa Focused Family Therapy. Even though there is less evidence published for these novel psychotherapeutic methods, we use cognitive remediation therapy or cognitive remediation and emotion skills training quite a lot on our inpatient ward. Cognitive remediation therapy or in short CRT was originally developed to be used for the rehabilitation of individuals with various neuropsychological issues however, has since been adapted to address the common problem of cognitive inflexibility among individuals with anorexia nervosa. This therapy aims to encourage multitasking and bigger picture thinking to break inflexible thinking patterns and habits through the practice of simple tasks and mental exercises. CRT can be delivered either on a one-to-one -one basis typically over 10, 45 minute sessions, or as a briefer format in a group setting over five or six sessions. It can be used with adults or children and adolescents and is suitable even for patients with very low BMI, unlike most talking therapies, allowing them to engage in psychological work early on in the treatment. However, CRT is not a standalone treatment for eating disorders, does not directly target weight change, and as such is not included in the NICE or other guidelines. Cognitive remediation and emotional skills training, or in short CREST, is an intervention developed to address problems with identifying, managing and expressing emotions among individuals with anorexia nervosa. Like CRT, it is an intervention that can be offered early on in treatment, when patients may not be able to use more complex psychological therapies. CREST is generally delivered over 8 to 10 sessions. Typically, if a patient has previously had CRT, they are offered 8 individual sessions on CREST. If patients have not had any experience on CRT, they will first have two sessions focused on thinking styles, followed by eight sessions involving the psychoeducation and experimental elements of CREST. The main evidence for CREST comes from qualitative and quantitative evaluation of case studies. Detailed studies using qualitative data and self-report questionnaires offer positive feedback and show some promise. However, uh, randomized controlled trials are required to endorse this. The beauty about CRT and CREST is that you can start this form of psychotherapy even in patients with a very low BMI. If you are particularly interested in CRT and CREST, 
I would like to recommend the publications by Kay Chanturia's work group. Professor Chanturia has established and supervises these therapies on our inpatient ward. Now let's switch to music therapy, which is a creative arts therapy. There is evidence for its effectiveness in disorders highly comorbid with eating disorders, such as depression and generalized anxiety disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. Numerous case reports have been published on the use of music therapy in eating disorders, and sophisticated methods have been described for individual and group therapy, active and passive music therapy. We performed a systematic review to summarize the published benefits and potential side effects of the use of music and the evidence for its therapeutic application in people with eating disorders. And this review was published last year. When performing the systematic literature review on scientific studies on the effect of music in people with or at risk for eating disorders, we followed the PRISMA guidelines, we used PubMed and Web of Science as databases and applied the search terms music, music therapy, eating disorders, anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder. As you can see in this PRISMA flowchart, we identified 16 out of 119 articles that qualified as scientific studies. These studies involved a total of 3,792 participants and reported on the use of music or music therapy in individuals with or at risk for anorexia or bulimia nervosa. We did, however, not find any studies on the use of music in binge eating disorder. These are the main results in inpatients with anorexia nervosa. Listening to classical music was beneficial to food consumption. One of the classical music pieces that was chosen was Leopold Mozart's Toy Symphony. The Toy Symphony is uplifting music and actually a musical joke as key parts of the music are played with toy instruments like ratchets, rattles or cuckoo whistles. Um, I really love this music and it was certainly a great idea by Valentina Cardi and colleagues who performed and published this study using the Toy Symphony. Singing in a group reduced postprandial anxiety in anorexia inpatients and in outpatients. A songwriting as well as a session with a body monochord helped with the processing of therapeutically relevant topics in anorexia nervosa. And I will explain in a few seconds what a body monochord is. And in bulimia nervosa, what casts, which also included positive visual or autobiographical stimuli, helped bulimia nervosa patients with anxiety and with body image perception problems. Uh, this is a body monochord. The instrument lies on the body of a patient so that the patient can hear the sound but also feel the vibrations. Studies which investigated the effect of watching music videos or music TV or social media showed that pre-teenage and teenage girls experienced body dissatisfaction, a drive for thinness, body weight concerns and a preoccupation for physical appearance. Um, this is a, a picture from a current YouTube video from a video called Mega Hits 2021. Taken together, our systematic review showed that the therapeutic application of music may be beneficial in patients with anorexia nervosa under certain circumstances. It also revealed that the availability of studies with a rigorous randomized controlled trial design is scarce. Future studies will hopefully find answers to the questions how music should be applied 
whom we should offer music therapy, what important outcomes are, and uh, what potential side effects the different types of music might have in people with anorexia nervosa. Last year I had two master students, Priyana Applewhite and Aishwarya Krishna Priya, who did a survey in 41 patients with anorexia nervosa to investigate their attitudes surrounding music and their thoughts on the potential therapeutic use of music. Patients completed a questionnaire of 50 questions. Some of the questions were open. These free text responses to the open questions were qualitatively analyzed for reoccurring themes with NVivo 12 software. Yes, no questions and questions of best fit were analyzed using SPSS. The most prevalent theme in the free text answers was the positive effect of music. 83% reported that listening to music evokes varying emotions in them, which could be positive or negative emotions. Patients associated certain music with particular positive, but also with particular negative memories. 85% of patients said music helps to distract themselves, 59 stated that music helps with loneliness, and 58% answered that music helps to feel more connected to others. Most patients indicated that they would like to attend a music therapy session. This figure shows the distribution of the frequency of themes coded from all 41 participants. As you can see in the green section, the positive effect of music was the most frequent theme. The benefit of music was the second most frequent theme. In summary, our survey found that people with anorexia nervosa make a lot of non-clinical use of music. They are aware that music elicits positive as well as negative emotions and memories. Patients felt that music is beneficial with regard to important aspects of anorexia nervosa, such as emotional problems, loneliness and relationship difficulties. And most patients would also like to attend music therapy. I should also mention that we had quite opposing answers from different people in the free text sections. Some patients found it helpful to have music playing during main meals. Others were strictly against music during mealtimes. Overall, people have a very individualized taste for music. Thus, it is a challenge to find music that is perceived as helpful by a whole group of patients. About five years ago, a new occupational therapist started on our ward, who is also a singer. We met with a few patients to discuss whether we should offer a music group on our ward, and we agreed on a basic concept how this group should look like. Since then, we usually meet on Mondays between 4 and 5 p.m. If we are not restricted by COVID-19 trust guidelines, the music group has two facilitators, one OT, who is interested in music, and I am the second facilitator. I play the piano during these groups. Patients can choose whether they want to sing or play an instrument. The aim of our group is to practice music together, to meet, to socialize and to have fun together, but also to perform. We had amazing performances and these gigs improved people's self-confidence. Patients are usually keen to entertain their families and friends. Um, when we have a group, we all introduce ourselves first and then the facilitators give information about the group. Afterwards, we do a warm up and practice a new song, which has been collaboratively agreed on in the previous session. Afterwards, we sing a few songs which are already known to the group and choose a new song for the next week. As in every psychiatric group, we don't want to miss a proper reflection on the group at the end of the session. 
The music group is very popular on our board and probably the longest running weekly group since I started to work in the service five years ago. My personal experience is that it is quite hard as a consultant psychiatrist to establish a reliable but also open and relaxed relationship with a patient. Specifically, if you work on a ward like ours with severely affected patients who need tube feeding or involuntary treatment under the Mental Health Act. I assume every psychiatrist has their own way to do something cheerful and entertaining with their patients, uh, specifically under those circumstances, and my way is to make music with them. Here's an example of the feedback I got from one of my patients. Thank you for all the time you've put into my care, but especially for all the time put into the music group. I loved every moment and the performance really made my Christmas. Thank you so much. Best wishes. If you are thinking about adding some music elements to your therapy, I can recommend this book, Creative Arts Therapies and Clients with Eating Disorders, it is edited by Anne Heiderscheid, who also helped us with our systematic review on music and eating disorders. I've been inspired by this book, for example, developing emergency playlists with patients with songs uh, they can listen to in case they feel tensed or depressed, or in case they have problems to fall asleep. That's something every psychiatrist or psychotherapist can do. Even though I love psychopharmacology, I think that it's better if you can replace sleeping pills and benzodiazepines by suitable music. I would like to close my presentation with some speculations on novel and future therapeutic options. In the near future, we'll probably know whether antipsychotics like olanzapin are safe and effective in people with anorexia nervosa or not. And whether olanzapin can be officially used in adults and adolescents. I assume the idea to use drugs targeting the cannabinoid system will also be further explored in the future. Thus, the cannabinoid receptor agonist tronabinol could be a future treatment option. There are also studies planned to test psychedelic drugs in anorexia nervosa. The idea is that these drugs make patients more amenable to psychotherapy and increase their neuroplasticity and thus improve their memory and help them with depression as treatment resistant depression is a big problem in people with anorexia nervosa. We are currently updating the guidelines of the World Federation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry, that's the WFSBP, on pharmacological treatment of eating disorders. This is a very effortful and complex project, but I hope we'll be able to publish these new guidelines at the end of this year in the World Journal of Biological Psychiatry. In these guidelines, you'll find information on all published drug trials and the evidence for and the evidence against a recommendation for the specific tested drugs. I would also like to mention brain stimulation methods. These methods might influence the brain systems we have talked about, the self-regulatory, the hedonic and the homeostatic system. They might also help people with anorexia nervosa to overcome their depression and anxieties and therefore indirectly lead to improvements regarding their eating disorder. We have learned that depression is a key obstacle in recovery of, in many psychiatric disorders. People who have lost their hope, their perspective and energy won't be able to fight the uphill battle to achieve recovery. Thus, there are ongoing studies on transcranial magnetic stimulation, transcranial direct current stimulation, and deep brain stimulation in anorexia nervosa. People with anorexia nervosa are often obsessed with food and draw their attention towards, 
health-related environmental cues. Therefore, psychotherapists have developed specific attention bias modification trainings, which are currently evaluated. We have already talked about the cognitive remediation therapies CRT and CREST. I have left out the family and carers interventions, but we know that carers and families can be a key source of support in a patient's recovery and the family should be involved from the first day of anorexia nervosa treatment. I haven't talked about web-based interventions. However, from my experience, web-based informations have some advantages. For example, if we can provide online meal support in a patient's home, the patients can learn how to eat in their natural environment. Quite often patients learn quickly how to eat in the hospital or in a daycare unit, but they can't continue with this regular eating pattern after discharge. And this is only one example where web-based treatments might have a big advantage. I have mentioned the microbiome and the immune system. I'm sure that immunological therapies will play a big role in the future of our treatment strategies. Potential future treatment strategies might be cytokine blockers or immune modulators, prebiotics, probiotics, or even fecal transplantation. In the future, we might have a more comprehensive functional and mechanistic model to understand eating disorders. This would enable us to individually tailor the treatment for specific patients with anorexia nervosa based on epidemiological and multiomics data, psychological and neuroimaging data, clinical characteristics, including psychiatric and somatic comorbidities, essential information about the developmental, the psychiatric and the family history of a patient, as well as their occupation and hobbies. But this will require a more advanced use of machine learning to analyze vast data sets. However, um, some of this is pie in the sky. And as we are waiting for the computers and machines to optimize the therapies we can offer, we need to keep ourselves and our patients happy and occupied. And therefore, my advice is not to forget about uh, creative therapies like music, dance, OT and arts. And I do hope that we'll have more serious and thoroughly designed research on creative therapies in the future. I would like to thank my colleagues at King's College London, Tel Aviv University, the University of Sydney, Augsburg University at Minneapolis, and at the Bethlehem Royal Hospital, who helped me with my clinical work, grant applications, projects, and publications. And I thank you for your attention. I am happy to answer any questions you might have. And if you have questions after this Congress, please feel free to write me an email. Thank you very much.